Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you help us this evening? Help us to understand your word. Lord, we can be so dull and blind, but we pray that you would help us. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, a few months ago, I headed over to Charminster and I went to a party. And it was a good party because the music wasn't too loud and the food was good and there were some other Christians there as well. And during the course of the evening, I, uh, I happened to overhear part of a conversation that a boy and a girl were having. And it sounded like the girl had asked the boy how church uh, was going and the boy um, said that he'd recently moved churches but what's more he used this phrase he said God has told me to go to this particular church and in that moment I allowed myself to feel like I was less of a Christian less because how often could I say God told me to dot 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 and I felt like there was almost some distance uh, between me and that guy who was hopefully a fellow believer. And I, I, I'm hope the guy wasn't intending to make anyone feel awkward. And I'm certainly not against uh, people having great confidence uh, that God might be leading them to do something or leading them to not do something. But at that time, I felt pretty small. And I wonder if you've ever felt like that. Like perhaps as a Christian, you're not quite, quite up to scratch. Maybe there's something missing. Do you feel a bit uh, separate from other believers who perhaps, you know, do you perhaps think they're a bit better than you in some way? Well, the issue of uh, division and unity amongst believers is big in the passage we're going to be uh, looking at this evening. And we're going to see how the Apostle Paul uh, deals with what is going on at the church in Antioch. And our first point this evening uh, is to do with who does God accept? If we look at the first paragraph, verse 11 is very interesting, very surprising, and it's surprising because of who is involved. You see, at the start of the letter, uh, back in chapter 1, we read that Paul is writing because there's been this uh, false gospel that appears to have been going round um, in, in the Galatian church. And it's pretty obvious. Of course, it'd be opposed to that. But here we find that he's opposing Peter. You see in verse 11, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Now, Peter is a brother. He's a fellow Christian, a fellow worker for the spread of the gospel. And we know that these things are true about Peter because in, in the paragraph before, we see that Peter is, is there with Paul in Jerusalem and uh, he gives Paul the right hand of fellowship. So both Paul and Peter were united in their gospel uh, convictions. So the last thing that we would really expect is to find Paul describing Peter's behavior as clearly in the wrong. So just what is the problem? Well, the story is helpfully split up into to two scenes, before and after. And the first scene, which we could call before, we see that Peter's gone to Antioch. And at mealtimes, he's happily eating with the Gentiles. So in verse 12, he used to eat with the Gentiles, it says. And of course, we know that Peter knew the gospel. We know that he believed that when Jesus died... Jesus died for all types of people who would come to trust in the Lord Jesus alone to save them. And although Peter was a Jew, he fully accepted the Gentile believers, even though they weren't obeying Jewish uh, customs regarding the food that they ate. He knew that the food they ate didn't make them unclean, as perhaps some other people would have said it made them. And Peter demonstrates this uh, through eating with them, because eating with someone was a way of identifying with them. It showed that you thought they were okay, you approved of them. And Peter's behavior at this point is in line with the gospel. But then we move on to the second scene, the after scene. 
and this begins in, in verse 12, we see that things didn't stay like that because these men come from James. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. So, somewhere along the line, Peter abandons eating with the Gentiles and he draws back and separates himself from them. Now, the circumstances in verses 11, 12, 13, they, they seem quite mundane. It seems like it's about who's eating with who or who's not eating uh, with who, but it's not quite as simple as that because as we're going to see, this matter and what is at the heart of it really strikes at the heart of the gospel. And Paul's going to um, defend the gospel later on. But it would be helpful for us to get a, a bit of a handle on the thoughts of those who are involved in this conflict. What, what are the different people thinking? We've got these men from James, we've got the circumcision group, we've got the Gentiles. If they were all thinking the same thing, then they'd be united. There'd be none of this eating with different people. And it seems that the issue revolves around the coming of Jesus and what happened when Jesus came. In particular, uh, what is the purpose of the law now Jesus has come? Should it be kept? Should we keep the law alongside trusting in Jesus? Is that the way to go? Or is faith alone in Jesus all that's necessary for us to get right with God? Well, the circumcision group obviously think that the Gentiles are unclean people. That's why they're, they're not eating with them. They, the Gentiles, they don't adhere to the, um, the law like the Jews tried to do. They would eat unclean food. And so that made the Gentiles unclean. And it might be, although we're not told, that perhaps when these people came, Peter, being a Jew felt like the heat was turned up on him a bit and he wasn't quite sure what to do and that's why he begins to to draw away and to separate himself with the circumcision group but I'm, I'm sure that if we were to ask Peter you know um, whether his gospel beliefs had changed uh, he would say no but his actions uh, betrayed and showed um, that he was acting out of line with what he knew to be true about the gospel and it's not just Peter alone because if we have a look at verse 13 the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray so the whole situation escalates it gets a bit bigger and we've got these other Jews and Barnabas now Barnabas is Paul's fellow teacher and preacher to the Gentiles he should, he should be Strong, And yet, perhaps because Peter, this leader in the church, is being swayed, Barnabas is swayed with him. So this event is about far more than who we eat with. Essentially, it's about who does God accept. Now, the circumcision group hadn't gone so far as to, or we don't think they've gone as far as to say the Gentiles weren't Christians. It doesn't say that. But you can see how the Gentiles might have been uh, made to feel like lesser Christians. And all the more when they see their uh, visitor, their important visitor, the Apostle Peter, abandoning eating with them. And you never know, the circumcision group might have just thought to themselves to be, well, more Christian. Because they, they were following the Jewish customs alongside Jesus. So, the circumcision group were, were struggling with this issue of, of what does Jesus mean in this respect? Are we to reject the law and just trust in Jesus alone? Or should we be expecting these Gentiles to abstain from certain foods, to follow the, the same rules, the same law that we followed? Well, Paul saw that this, uh, that a, a truth central to the gospel was being opposed and that it couldn't just be left or ignored, ignored sorry. and 
I don't know if you remember a few weeks ago, but Alex Ferguson uh, released a book. It was his autobiography. And in it, um, some details were revealed about what had gone on during his time managing Manchester United. And he highlighted a point in David Beckham's career where he felt that David Beckham was just getting a little bit too big for his boots. And the most important issue, the central thing, was uh, threatened. And the, the central thing was Alex Ferguson as the manager. He didn't want to feel threatened. And so he made the decision that David Beckham had to leave because the most important thing had been opposed. But what does this all mean for us? It may seem a little uh, removed from here and now, uh, but I think there is, there is relevance from these opening verses. I think there's two challenges. I think the first challenge comes from uh, the circumcision group and from Peter. And I think the second challenge comes from Paul. So from the circumcision group and Peter, I think we're, we're faced with, do we ever consider other believers to be, in a sense, unclean? Are there things you know or you think about other believers, which means you, you put yourself on a different level to them, perhaps? Are we ever prone to look down on a believer who uh, maybe has struggles in their marriage? Or how about a brother or sister who's, who's struggling with a particular sin? Do you ever feel divided from them? Or from a, a, a brother or sister who just, well, isn't much like you? And you, you don't really feel like you've, you've got much in common with them. Do, do we view everyone as being accepted by God on the same basis as us? Because a church living in line with the gospel is not going to have this separation, this division amongst the believers. But I think a second challenge comes from Paul, and that is we see that Paul knew straight away that Peter's conduct wasn't in line with the gospel. And are we familiar enough with the gospel? Do we know the gospel? Do we know its truths to be able to spot error and to avoid ourselves from easily slipping into it? Well, Paul doesn't let any aspect of his uh, relationship uh, prevent him from acting to resolve the division. You see, Paul really loves the church in Antioch. And because he loves them, he wants them to be established firmly in the gospel and in the gospel truths. So following on from the opposition, Paul, makes, uh, Paul sets about making clear the basis of a person's acceptance with God, which is our second point. And we're told in verse 14, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew and yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So the accusation Paul is making against Peter is, why do you force these Gentiles to, to do what the Jews do, to follow their customs? And he makes it clear in verse um, 15, we who are Jews by birth are not Gentile sinners. So he, he's saying to, to Peter, look, we're the same. We're Jews. We were given the, the law initially. We know about those things. And we're not like those Gentiles who are, don't have the law, sinners, in a sense. But Paul, despite this differentiation, Paul establishes that him and Peter aren't pinning their hopes on, on law-keeping, aren't pinning their, their justification on keeping the law. Now, he declares that him and Peter know something. And that word know in verse 16, the start of verse 16, is very important because he doesn't say they think or they guess or they've got a hunch. He's much more solid than that. He says they know. And what is it that him and Peter no. Well, verse 16, they know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And then he repeats it again. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, 
and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Over and over again in verse 16, Paul is saying, Jesus Christ, yes, law observance, no, in terms of being justified by God. But why? Why is this whole issue of being justified so important? To be justified means that we're we're reconciled to God. And what could be more important than that? Being reconciled to the God that we're going to give an account to. And so to be clear on how, what the basis is for our acceptance for our justification is vital. Now, circumcision is not really uh, a particular concern for most people here today, I don't think, in terms of being uh, justified with God. But I think there are some modern-day spins we can put on this, some modern-day ideas people have about how they'll be justified before God, about how they'll be okay when it comes down to meeting God. And last weekend, I... I went to Sheffield to see, uh, to see my family, and while I was there, I went to church on a Sunday evening, and this issue of justification was mentioned in the sermon. And to illustrate the point, uh, the, the vicar uh, recalled comments he'd heard from various people about how they hope uh, they're going to be justified before God. And maybe you're here today and you're, you're not a Christian, or maybe you've got friends and these might be some of the things that they would say as reasons why why god ought to accept them perhaps they'd say something like well you know i I go to church i go to church or i was taken to church as a child at least or i went to sunday school i went to sunday school and what what would paul say to that he'd say it doesn't matter it's faith in christ which justifies, which makes you right. Or perhaps another person might say, well, I've been baptized, or I've been confirmed, something like that. Again, Paul would say, no, it's faith in Jesus. and Faith in Jesus. And so, there were some other examples, some ridiculous ones, like, well, my grandfather used to ring the church bells, or I watch songs of praise. How anyone could imagine that, you know, God is going to be impressed with that, I, I don't know. But again, Paul would say to all of those, no, faith in Jesus. It's faith in Jesus that makes you right with God. It's what these people need to hear. It's what I should have remembered when I was at that party and I was feeling pretty small next to that other guy. And in fact, Jesus told a story about this exact issue about being right with God. I wonder if you remember, you know, there's there's the temple and there's two men who go into the temple You've got the the Pharisee and the tax collector, and the Pharisee stands there and basically is full of himself. You know, look, Lord, I'm not like this person. I do this, I do that. Surely that's good enough. Surely that's what makes me right. And then we're told about the, the tax collector who stands there, won't even look up to heaven, beats his breast and says, Lord, have mercy on me. Doesn't come with his arms full of his own, you know, works or achievements. And Jesus says, it's the tax collector. He was the one that was justified. Now that's just the beginning of Paul's response to Peter, really, because he continues in verse uh, 17. And you could almost imagine in verse 17 that a Jewish Christian hears this stuff about uh, faith in Christ and thinks, well, that's very interesting, but let's get one or two things straight And maybe he he would run to Paul with this question. Have a look at verse 17. He might say, If, while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Now, it seems a little bit complicated at first, but what he's basically saying is, look, if I give up on the law to justify me, and I trust solely in Jesus... And doesn't that make me like a Gentile? Like one of those who who never had the law? And therefore, doesn't Jesus just free me to do whatever I want? Doesn't he give me license to sin? Doesn't he just encourage sin, in fact? And Paul knows this is coming, this objection. And so, at the end of verse 17, he says, Absolutely not. 
He says, don't think the answer to this is to go back to the law. Have a look at verse 18. He says, if I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. If I rebuild what I destroyed, now that's the law. The law is destroyed through our faith in Christ. And to go back to it and to not trust in Jesus, that would be the real sin. That would be the real uh, offense. But why? Why does it make somebody a lawbreaker? And the reason is that the law was never an end in itself. It was never able to justify anybody. Paul has said that over and over in verse 16, hasn't he? But the law was the, the pointer to Jesus. And Jews like Peter and Paul, they knew this to be true. They knew that the law was a pointer to Jesus, and so they put their faith in him. And there's a new life that comes about when somebody does that, when somebody puts their faith in Jesus, a life of, of justification, the justified life, you might say. And Paul goes further in answering this, uh, this possible objection about Jesus promoting sin by saying that a person needs to die in regards to the law in order to live for God. Verse 19, he says, For through the law... I died to the law. And the reason why is so that he might live for God. But how, how does that happen? How does that happen? How do you die to the law? How do you die to the law? And the answer is in verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. So the way to die to the law and to live to God is by being united to Christ, by being connected uh, to Christ. And this is a, a very deep union with Christ. This is not a light thing. This is union in his death. Paul says, I've been crucified with him and I no longer live. But how does that make us die to the law? And I think we need to think for a moment about why Jesus died and the relationship of Jesus' death to the law. We know Jesus was perfect. And yet he died, and in his death, God punished the sin of those who have broken his law, both Jew and Gentile alike. And once that debt is paid, we can be freed from the law. Because our debt is paid. The things we've done wrong against the law are paid for. We can die to it, essentially. So for the person who is trusted in, in the Lord Jesus, when he died, they died. And so the Christian is dead to the law through Jesus' death. I'm um, very thankful to have a car. I got it about four years ago. But I couldn't afford to pay for the car all at once. So I've had to pay uh, a sum of money each month for the past four, nearly five years or so. That's, that's like my debt. And once that debt is paid... I'm free. I may as well be dead to the company I'm paying to. I'm, I'm paying the money to because they no longer have a hold on me. The car's mine. I'm free. I'll be very happy. But there's, there's a sense, though, that not only is the, the Christian um, dead in verse 20, but Jesus now lives in them. So they, they still go on living, they still go on breathing but not as they used to, because now, now Christ lives in them. They're new creatures, we'll read later on. Creatures not defined by the law, but defined by a, a relationship to God. And that relationship to God isn't something we only look forward to beyond death, but it's something we have right now. You see, Paul says in the middle of verse 20, the life I live in the body. So Jesus lives in Christians right now. And notice something else, because there's a contrast here with verse 16. In verse 16, Paul is talking about how 
a man is made right in that instance, you know, in an instant, made right with God through their faith in Jesus. But here he's talking about living, the life I live in the body. I live by faith, he says, in the Son of God. And this is something we ought to remember. We are justified by faith, but then we live by faith. We don't move on to, to something else. I wonder, do we, do we realize that on a day-to-day -day basis? My head might say, yes, I realize that, but do, do my actions show that I believe it? And do we believe that Christ lives in us? We're not slaves uh, to sin anymore. So Paul says, I live by faith in the Son of God. And then he goes on, who loved me and gave himself for me. And this is true of every single Christian. This is a glorious truth he's stuck in here. Jesus, the Son of God, loved you and gave himself for you. And because he's done that, we're right with God. We're right with God. Jesus does all the giving. I don't come to God presenting anything. Jesus gave himself, and as he gives himself, he justifies his people, and he makes them united. There's no division in them. And therefore, to act as if we uh, believe that something we do or something we, we've done in the past makes us more or less acceptable to God is wrong and, in fact, sets aside the grace of God Verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. God makes no division amongst his people. All are justified in the same way, Jew, Gentile, regardless of what they've done. And so let none of us set aside the grace of God by what we do. And so there was division at the start of this passage amongst the believers. There shouldn't have been, though. They were all justified the same way. And I hope that, that for us, justification will, will always be in our heads. You know, the way in which we're, we're right with God, it's through what Jesus has done. It's, it's him alone that makes us right with God. Amen.